Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. We are recording. Okay. And how long is this? As long as we want. So what's important to me is to capture everything on audio. So I don't care how long it is. It's just... And I never thought anybody would want to listen to all these things. And it's like the chem tape. They love it. So go figure. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Solaria Report. This is Catherine Austin Fitz, and I'm joined by the amazing Carolyn Betts Esquire, who is my attorney and general counsel to all my companies. This is about as long as I can remember. Um, there are many things you need to know about Carolyn in terms of her resume. She, she's a Bryn Mawr girl, and she has a very distinguished academic record, but then got an MBA, worked in the brokerage and securities world. She knows a great deal about business and securities, and then went to law school, working her way up to a partner at a Washington law firm, and decided to leave the practice of law and become an investment banker at Hamilton Securities, where she distinguished herself. And then when the firm uh, became embroiled in litigation, I asked Carolyn if she would convert back to being an attorney and handle what was one of the largest portfolios of different legal expertise as anyone could possibly imagine. It was an astonishing intellectual achievement from mortgages to real estate to politics to litigation to criminal law to black budget law and taxes and on and on and on. And what you need to know about Carolyn are two things. One is that she saved my life, number one. And number two, she was the one who found the missing money. <laughs> So you'll hear people when they interview Dr. Skidmore say, well, it really wasn't Dr. Skidmore who found the missing money. It was Catherine Austin Fitz. And the reality is, no, it really wasn't Catherine Austin Fitz. It was Carolyn Betts. Um, and the last thing I will say is she has a remarkable sense of both history and humor. So Carolyn, with that, thank you for joining me on the Salir Report. And once again, thank you for saving my life. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Gideon became our project management name for everything associated with the litigation because it was a very immersive process. You had 18 audits and investigations. You had, including the state litigation at one time, 12 tracks of litigation um, in both federal and state court. And then you had all the physical harassment surveillance. You had a smear campaign. You had a whisper campaign. You know, and so it was sort of coming at you 360 degrees. And one of the challenges of doing legal work was you're having to do the legal work in the midst of a unbelievably violent and incoherent environment. Is that fair to say, Carolyn? Well, yes. And you're also looking at what the law is, which is sort of the 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 overt world, and trying to figure out why things are happening that are not overt. They're they're under they're they're hidden. And right. you're trying to live in a world where you're speaking about the overt while understanding the covert. And right. uh, it's it's uh, challenging. Sometimes I used to say, we decided to pick a fight with all the money on the planet. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> it was everybody. You were up against left, right, Republican, Democrat. It was everybody... You know, you were bubbling the U.S. economy and sucking a huge amount out, including out of HUD. And everybody was making money, except for us. You know, the honest guys. But um, I think one way I would make it easier to sort of simplify for the listener is if you were going to steal this much money out of HUD in Washington, you needed to get the honest people out of the way. And so we had to go... And the government officials we were supporting had to go. And how do you get rid of people? You have a phony baloney scandal. You know, I'm always cringing when somebody introduces me as a whistleblower. I said, no, I was a target of a whistleblower. Whistleblowers are not necessarily what you think they are. So let's describe, if you could describe the key TAM and, so describe the construct of the private lawsuit and the public lawsuit under seal and sort of the construct they used to squeeze us legally. Okay, well, so at Hamilton, we were a HUD contractor, uh, and we were on a cross-cutting basis advising HUD about their various 
tra- very large transactions in mortgage loans that at some point I think we understood were not kosher, but in the beginning we assumed they were legitimate government insured mortgage loans or properties that were supported with with section 8 financing for the rents or both and we were working on the mark to market program where we were advising HUD about how to get out from under this situation where government guarantees were guaranteeing the rents or guaranteeing the mortgage payments on properties that where the rental income was also paid by HUD and so it was not a market-based system at all. And so we started selling mortgages into the, the public markets, Goldman Sachs, that kind of big money firms that were interested in buying the mortgages, packaging them, and turning them into reselling them as mortgage-backed securities. And we, we got into a portfolio that was government-subsidized, where the rents were government subsidized, at least part of the part of the properties. And we knew that there was going to be a blowback from somewhere. And at least my understanding, we've never, I think, talked about this, but my understanding, my recollection is that we were expecting a lawsuit, basically a temporary restraining order being filed by somebody who didn't like it, like Harvard Endowment. Harvard Endowment, if I remember correctly, owned a big portion of the the lo- of the properties that were financed by these loans, and they were possibly going to lose a lot of money if private if the private sector bought these loans and then enforced them, right? Because they basically had no no equity in the loans, <laughs> and HUD kept turning them over. Well, they were getting a big fee flow from the property management. Well, right, right, right. Right. Um, but if they're sold into the private sector, you know, the game is over. So we were expecting a lawsuit, and we did the sale. We call it the part- partially assisted sale, and nothing happened, except something did happen. We just didn't know about it. There was a, a private Ketam suit that was under seal, and Ketam, a Ketam suit is a Federal False Claims Act suit, and it's basically a whistleblower knows something that other people don't know about someone jipping the government and files suit on behalf of the government. And he's called a relator, the person who is the whistleblower. And the whistleblower is basically suing someone else on behalf of the government in the shoes of the government. And he gets a piece of the action if there's money collected. And we've heard all sorts of legitimate whistleblower cases, and a lot of them involve drug firms and uh, things like that, but this was a, this one was under seal. The seal was supposed to be uh, some fairly short period of time, and it was extended for a number of years. Four, <laughs> yeah. So we did not know that the the way they hid the whistleblower suit was that there was another suit that was sort of a mirror suit that was public, and we were named. It was against HUD and us. Is that right? I HUD. think it was just against us. Okay, I, was, I'm sorry, just against Williams, HUD. Williams Adley. The public, the public lawsuit I thought was against HUD. And, okay, and right. the private was against. But we were investigated because we were a contractor for HUD. Right. So we got subpoenas and we had to produce documents, but we thought we were producing them for the public suit. Right. But the trick on the private suit was, if you're a target of a key tam, if you're subpoenaed for that key tam, you have to be told. And they, what they did was, and I think this was illegal, they circumvented the requirement by delegating the subpoena power to the HUD IG and had them do all the subpoenas. And the pretext, of course, was this other lawsuit. Right. But the goal was, so you have two lawsuits, one in, in, the, in the star chamber, and because it's only supposed to be, it's under seal for, I think, 60 to 90 days unless they can put forward real evidence. And they could never find any, any any evidence of wrongdoing. And the judge... We found out later. Right. The first judge said, I'm not going to renew this because you have no evidence of any wrongdoing. This is a fishing expedition. And then he gets fast-acting cancer and dies. Right. Judge Witchy. Right. And then the former general counsel of the CIA gets appointed as his replacement judge, 
who just happens to find a way to extend it for many, many years, despite the fact of no evidence. But meantime, in this other court, so you have two courts, and the government is taking the opposite position in both courts. One court, they're saying the sky is blue, and the other, they're saying the sky is not blue, it's green. And you literally have, at the very top of the Department of Justice, coordination so that they can keep opposite positions going in two courts, one behind seal and one open. So here's the thing. Sometimes people think the government is one place or HUD is one place. During the HUD loan sales, we led loan sales for $10 billion. During the HUD loan sales, I don't know if you remember this, the deputy assistant secretary who's running the loan sales had a meeting with the HUD IG because they wanted to sell defaulted mortgages that the HUD IG was doing enforcement actions. And the HUD IG took the position, if you leave it in the portfolio and don't sell it, then we have a better chance of getting the develop cash from the developer because the developer still controls the cash flows. And the deputy assistant secretary pulled out the statistics we'd prepared and proved that you would lose for, you know, you were losing a certain value on the property every year. And so, so you'd lose on a million dollar property, you could lose a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars per year as it sit there not taken care of. And the HUD IG said, yeah, but we don't care about the FHA fund. We only care about the money we get. So if we're doing an enforcement action for 25000 we don't care if the fund loses one hundred or 200000 We care about the 25000 because we get to spend that money by the appropriators. And so that's when we started to refer to them as the Sheriff of Nottingham because these people were making money. And in fact, the guy who brought the whistleblower lawsuit was working a contract where he was referring enforcement actions to the sheriff of Nottingham so they could make money. Everybody was in the business of making money on neighborhoods failing. Well, and he was also servicing the loans while they were in portfolios. So when HUD sold them in our loan sales, he was losing business. Right. So they made money on things not working is what it was working out to be. And of course, Harvard Endowment made a lot of money on things not working because they could charge huge property management fees. Mm -hmm. 